that, I think we can all agree, was utterly stunning, whether we understood it or not. <laughs> uh, now, there is a chance now for questions. I, there are microphones on the table. Carol, I wonder whether you'd be incredibly kind to pick up one of the microphones to take to anyone who might want to pose a question. There's microphones here. Uh, and Terry, if you could perhaps do the same. Can I ask, I know that Terry has a question he wants to pose. Any questions from anyone part of that? Question here. Uh, I think it's going to be impossible to get the microphone to you there. Can you just, just speak loud? Yes. And then you had another slide where you kind of, as time goes forward, all your leg pores kind of made pop. And you had your like, very boring universe. So, how does this fit together? Because if all the black holes make pop, then you don't have any black holes left, which like, can collide from the big mess. Well, the usual picture, picture would be for a universe which, you see, if it, if it Collapses, it depends how, how soon it does. And certainly in most models where the universe is supposed to collapse, it does it far in advance of the evaporation of the black holes. So they, so they would still be there. You see, if you're thinking about 10 to the 100 years, they usually don't talk about that time, kind of time scale. But you're right. If you were allowed to wait that long, <laughs> then they'd have gone. And so that wouldn't be a problem. But, you see, I'm not really talking about that in that hypothetical collapsing universe. I'm really not saying that's what we really expect the universe to be like. It's just a picture that if the universe were like ours now, but with the time going the other way around, and with the entropy going the other way, so you would form black holes, and those black holes would not have time to evaporate, then you get the right mess. But you're quite right that if you're allowed to wait that long to, to, until they'd all gone, then you wouldn't have that particular problem. But it doesn't affect the hypothetical situation I was talking about, or the models which people normally talk about, such as the steinhardt turok model, in which the universe is supposed to uh, recollapse in a trillion years or something. A trillion years is nothing, you see. <laughs> when we're thinking of, of uh, the time scale for the black hole to evaporate. But yes, you're, you're completely right about the, the issue involved, yes. Okay, any further questions? Well, uh, since, since I have a microphone in my hand, I should ask <laughs> you a question. Yes. I thought I would read one of your books before this lecture to, to understand a bit more. I came across your book entitled Fashions, Faith and Fantasy. Now, I, I found it hard going. I got as far as page 266. I came across a comment. Let me read it to you. You wrote, for this to be physically plausible, some believable mathematical scheme would have to be presented consistent with current physical understanding. Now, the question I put is, mathematics is purely a human construct. It all comes out of our head. Might there not be some physical realities that cannot be described by human mathematics? Well, of course, it depends how wide human mathematics is. So, see, I have a very different view about mathematics from that. It's more, I, I think I, I, I should show my picture of the three worlds. That would explain my viewpoint. See, there are three forms of reality, in a sense, in this picture. One is the physical world, made of things like this table and so on, physical things, so that's the physical world. Then there's the world of mentality, which somehow emerges out of the physical world. Somehow, um, you know, creatures evolve and they evolve into humans and somehow this mentality comes about, whatever it is. And that's the world of mentality. So another conscious experience, if you like. And then there is the third world, which I review as having its own existence, which is the platonic world of mathematics. So you've described it as sort of a human creation. But that's certainly not the way I think of it, and certainly not the way most mathematicians think of it. They think of it more like you're exploring something out there. They're not creating the mathematics. They're using their understanding to explore the world of mathematics. The world, And certainly if you think about the history of the universe, I mean, you might say, well... Whatever view you take, you could take conventional cosmology, there was this big bang and there weren't any conscious beings around then. Yet, that 
universe seems to evolve in accordance with mathematical laws. And certainly, if you were to throw mathematics out and not describe, people would be completely lost. But it does seem to fit extremely well. And as I showed that beautiful curve with the you know, bumps in it, I didn't say much about it, but that was the curve explaining what the microwave background, the different um, harmonics of it behave. And that's an amazing piece. Well, it's, it got the Nobel Prize recently, so it's <laughs> well established. And Jim Peebles yeah. was a big fan. Yes, I, I take your point. <laughs> yes. You start by dropping an apple, and mathematics, our mathematics can explain very well how it goes. Yes, indeed. At the far end, you have this mathematics that can explain almost everything we see. My question was, might there come a point where the human mind is unable to explain it? Well, it might be uh, that where minds are not capable of, of... I mean, some people argue that. They say, well, we've reached the limit of what the human mind is capable of, and so we might as well give up and not look for more laws. I don't believe in that. I think it's most unlikely... I mean, maybe there is a limit somewhere, but I would think it's most unlikely that that will be what stops us from finding laws, deeper laws than we know at the moment. I mean, whether it will stop us getting to the final answer, if there is a final answer, I wouldn't like to say. I'm inclined to think negatively. I mean, I think that I, I don't see any reason why human capabilities wouldn't be able to grasp the mathematics. In fact, the mathematics that people, um, mathematicians think about is far more abstract and hard to understand than the mathematics which is used in physics. So if, if you, if you were actually talk to a, you know, maybe think about the work of Grotendieck or something, uh, it's much more abstract and sophisticated than that relatively trivial kind of mathematics which is used in physics. The mathematics of quantum mechanics it's not that complicated by, by contrast with that. So I don't think that with regard to the mathematics, we're anywhere close to the limit of what human consciousness is able to achieve. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Question here? I think you're putting up your hand, or is that uh, for some other purpose? Uh, when you see the conform cyclic yes. cosmology, wonderful drawing that for me looks like bamboo. Yes. Uh, it's just stacking. And with my old little logic, it seems like that would repeat itself in both directions. Yes, so indeed. So are you proposing that there is no beginning and there is no end? Yes. Well, you see, perhaps I was too much influenced by my early days um, when I was at St. John's College, Cambridge, <clears throat> influenced by Dennis Sharma and Bondi and Gold and pretty well Fred Hoyle. And they, at that time, had this very beautiful model of the universe, which was known as the steady state model. And I found that rather an attractive picture, that the universe somehow didn't have a beginning and it wouldn't have an end and it just went on indefinitely. Now that model was shown to be incorrect when the microwave background was discovered and it's very hard to fit that observation in with the steady state model. And even Dennis Sharma, I much admired him, being a very great promote, proponent of the steady state model for a long time, said he, he was wrong and that the model was like that. Now you see this model, although it's very different from steady state, has that same philosophical content. And it's quite curious, when you think back to Einstein, he much preferred a model which he had the, what's called the Einstein universe, which was like the bamboo but just made more or less static. In fact, he introduced his cosmological constant to make that model work, which is what we now call dark energy. At least I don't call it that because I think it's a bad term because it's not energy nor is it dark, but never mind. It's the thing which apparently is producing this exponential expansion in the remote future. And again, you have this static universe preferred by Einstein. You go back to Newton, and Newton also preferred a model in which somehow it, he may have had to somehow, the creator maybe had to come in and fix up the planets and put them back into orbit or something like that. But he also was very keen on a, on a, a universe which was uh, eternal in that respect. So it's quite interesting that these great thinkers, um, for some reason, whatever, 
like to think of a universe which didn't have a beginning. Einstein was very, when he first heard about it, Friedman and Lemaitre, and Einstein kept telling him, oh, your mathematics is good, but your physics is lousy. I think this, he's on record of having said that. But eventually he came around and he had to accept it. The observations really did show the universe was expanding and that the static picture was apparently uh, not working. But this is the next best thing in a certain sense, that overall is unchanging. Even though in detail it changes a lot, and even though you have to go through from one part of the cylinder to the other part, which looks very different, but from the conformal point of view, it's very, very similar. And so I am going back to that kind of philosophy of a universe which had no beginning. And yes, indeed, that's the picture. And no end. <laughs> right, I'm very conscious of time now, so we have just time for one more question. I'm going to take it from somebody who was at St. John's, and therefore... That's the right. Okay, the thank question. you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, well, j just a question. I, I've heard that in terms of the evolution of the universe and the movement of galaxies and so on, that um, the theory of gravity uh, and mass, their movement can't be explained by what we observe as their mass and the rules of gravity as, as we know them. And, and this has led to the theory of something called dark matter, which uh, exist but we can't see and but has to, if you want to explain with gravity the of, uh, uh, of the galaxies uh, so my question is uh, you know what is dark matter how does it work where would it come from and uh, does that have a relevance to black holes well I should I should say thank you for that question yes indeed um, let me explain there are these two things one of them is what they call dark energy. I think neither of them is a very good word, but particularly the dark energy, which is neither energy nor dark. It's a very peculiar kind of energy if it's energy. Um, and that is fully explained by Einstein's cosmological constant that he introduced in 1917 for the wrong reason. You see, he wanted this, as I was just explaining in answer to the previous question, uh, Einstein wanted a static model, and he had to introduce this term, which he called the cosmological constant, <clears throat> and then try to retract it afterwards. But it's rather hard to retract after you've introduced a thing like that. So it was in all the cosmology books. And I remember going to conferences where they were saying, well, in the next meeting, we will maybe know what the value of the cosmological constant is. And then when they defined what the value was by these supernovae and all that stuff, and then they said, it's this mysterious dark energy that we don't know what it is. Well, it's completely explained by Einstein's cosmological constant, and that's what I'm taking. Why it has the value it has is a mystery. But the fact that it's there... I consider not a mystery because it's the only thing you can do to the original Einstein equations which doesn't wreck them. And that's what Einstein himself did. He introduced that term. Now, dark matter is a different story. Dark matter is some kind of substance out there. There are various ideas that people have had from time to time trying to explain it in terms of modified gravity. Maybe you change the gravitational theory and maybe that dark matter isn't really there at all. It's just that the Einstein equations have to be modified. It doesn't really work, particularly because there are observations of colliding galaxies and it's complicated to see that the, the dust, which is most of the matter, not just the stars, and that follows... The, the stars and then the no the dust the dust gets caught you see I think that's right and and the dark matter goes through and so it's it's different anyway so all I mean is it's completely consistent with the Einstein cosmological constant it's very hard to make a modified gravity theory which is consistent with his observations so what I'm saying is that dark matter is out there and it is some substance now I haven't gone into this because I think people wouldn't have wanted me to write down equations. But if you actually start writing down the equations of how one of these cylinders join onto the next, I should say I'm very faithful to the Einstein equations. So I take the Einstein equations without modification, but with Einstein's cosmological term, without modification, and then you have to see how to make the conformal factors work. It only works if, when you go from one year onto the next, there is a creation of a, a, a material 
which is an addition to the other material around. And I claim that this is the initial form of dark matter. So it has to be there. And one of the features of dark matter, as observed, is it seems to interact only gravitationally. It doesn't have any other, it doesn't affect you know, electromagnetism, any other force. It seems to be entirely a gravitational thing. Well, that would be the case in the model that I'm describing. The, the term which is needed in the equations, um, which needs to be there to make the equations work, is consistent with what we see as dark matter. Now, one of the questions is, how massive is the dark matter particle? Well, if it's just gravity in some form, it should be what people call a Planck mass particle. Now, I should explain that a Planck mass is about the mass of a flea's eye. So it's not very much in ordinary terms, but from particle physics point of view, it's absolutely huge. And it's way off the scale. So particle physicists don't like that idea. <laughs> I remember asking Jim Peebles, as I mentioned before, of Nobel Prize fame now, I asked him, what are the limits on the scale of dark matter particles? How massive could the dark, mass particles, dark matter particles be? He said, the range is huge. They could be less massive than the lightest neutrino. They could be as massive as the sun. So that's an enormous range. So I say, how about a Planck mass particle? Fine. I asked Joe Silk, he said, mass, Planck mass, sure, that's fine. So although particle physicists don't like it because it's off the scale, it's all right from the observational point of view. So my claim is that yes, there would be these dark matter particles. They would have to decay because you can't have them build up from eon to eon. And this decay is important. They would decay in a time scale of about 10 to the 11 years. So that's a bit longer than the time from the Big Bang to us now, but not hugely longer. And that sort of time is the time scale that they start to decay significantly. And that decay is important partly because of possible future measurements. You might be able to give gravitational wave detectors could see them, it's quite possible. The other is that they would be the source of the temperature fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, which is what inflation was there to explain. That needs to, these are things which need more theory to see whether they work or not. But at least there is room for them in the theory that I've described. Not just room for them, but you need dark matter. Something like dark matter is needed, otherwise the theory will be inconsistent. There we are. I'm afraid we have to pause there. So, Edward, you've got a complete answer. They, <laughs> they obey all the laws. They're necessary for the laws to make. We don't know what the heck it is. <laughs> Before this lecture, I looked on Amazon at various of the books that uh, Professor Penrose has written. I also looked at the readers' comments, which fell into roughly three categories. First of all, if I was on a desert island and it had one book that I was allowed to take, this would be the book. Then a whole range of comments, complicated, very complicated, impossible, complicated, and so on. And, 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 and I think that is a fair summary of the situation. And then the final comment which I read was that someone saying, how could anyone possibly know so much? But it's not just know so much. Professor Penrose has invented so much. It is even beyond that. I think all of us today have witnessed something which is outside most of the ken of most of us here. It is another world, and we have been hugely privileged to be allowed in it to get a glimpse, in a very simplistic fashion, of a completely other world a world which is unravelling, determining the world that we live in and everything beyond. In a very humble fashion, because I recognise he is one of the world's greatest scientists, I would like to thank Professor Sir Roger Penrose very much indeed for having come to Paris today to talk to us. And uh, we have all benefited enormously. Thank you. Thank you.
I think you've suppressed the comments. There must have been one, people that said this is complete nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and thank you again.